Hi, my name is Brad Zdenek. I'm Innovation Strategist with the Nittany AI Alliance, and welcome to the first of our Nittany AI Challenge webinars uh, to talk through this challenge that we run, uh, give you some tips and tricks for how to uh, perform very well within it, and to give you kind of a sense of what the whole thing is. Um, you may or may not have heard of the Nittany AI Challenge before. This is our third year running the program. <clears throat> but over the last three years, we've learned quite a bit about what makes a successful team, uh, what makes a successful proposal. Uh, and we have tweaked the challenge overall a number of times as we've improved it over the years. Uh, so this will be really the opportunity to kind of give a deep dive into that, uh, to answer your questions, to give you some tips and tricks, and to just kind of get to know you a little bit uh, through the webinar and through the chat. So with that, there is a chat pod. Uh, if you click on the toolbar, depending on which version of Zoom you're using, if you click on the toolbar for Zoom, there should be a way of turning on your chat. Uh, there should be one message in it right now, uh, me welcoming everybody in here. But you can use that chat pod throughout to ask any questions you may have. Uh, and feel free to type those in as I go along. And as soon as I see a message pop up, I'll, I'll try to address it right there. Uh, so feel free to use that and ask any questions you may like. My goal is to finish this a little bit early on my part so that we can have a little bit of Q&A at the end, uh, depending on whether or not you have some ideas you want to throw out or what your questions may be. So um, we'll get started first with the Nittany AI Challenge and what it is. Uh, as I said, this is our third year running the program, but three years ago, we sat down as we uh, formed our unit, which used to be called the EdTech Network. Uh, we had a rebrand this past year to the Nittany AI Alliance. But when we were sitting down, we were thinking to ourselves, um, what can we do for this university? Uh, what, what can we be doing for the students that aligns with our mission but can really help our university, the students that are here, and, and advance the field of higher education. And so as we were thinking about it, the first thing that we started with was thinking about Penn State. Uh, we're here, uh, we are actually located here in University Park, but, but as Penn State, no matter which campus we're going to, we're right there in the middle of higher education. We're an extremely large and successful institution, accomplished institution. Um, and as you travel around the campuses, you may have different industries that are around each one of the campuses, uh, plastics and manufacturing up in Barron and Erie, uh, medical and Hershey. But what is the same across all of them is that we are all higher education. So what we thought is, okay, what if, what if we look at Penn State and we try to find the problems that we have, the challenges that we face? All of you should be able to look at Penn State and, and love it and appreciate it, but also recognize that there are things we can be doing better. There are things that we can improve. So the question is, how can we do that? Well, we thought maybe we could put a challenge together that can help address the problems that Penn State faces and bring in a couple other elements together. One of the big ones there is bringing together students with the problems that we face here at Penn State. We really truly believe that the students here at Penn State are not only some of the most innovative individuals that are here, some of the most uh, ambitious and, and uh, individuals with the greatest potential for changing Penn State. So what we thought is, if we have this underutilized resource at Penn State students who really know some of the problems because you're directly impacted by them, well, what if we brought students together with the challenges here at Penn State? And then we thought, there's another element we have to bring together, and that's industry. As you know from our name, we're all about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we thought, okay, let's bring together the problems at Penn State, the students that have the ability to, uh, to create the solutions to those problems, and let's support them by bringing together uh, major industry players in the artificial intelligence and machine learning space. This year, we have at the table uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud. As of this morning, it looks like we're going to have Microsoft Azure at the table and uh, our lead sponsor, which is Oracle. Each one of these companies is going to be bringing resources and people to the challenge to help participants in creating the solutions that they're going to create. And they all come together into this challenge. And this is it, this is the bulk of it. Um, the challenge is a scaffolded program with three phases, all focused on creating solutions to problems we face at Penn State. 
and we'll get to those in, in a few minutes. But it's laser focused on that. But we can't just tell you, hey, go fix something at Penn State. That's too much, that's too big. If it was that easy, quite honestly, the faculty and staff here would already be doing it. So we scaffold things a little bit and provide some supports. The first and most important point, deadline, whatever, for you is January 29th, as you see on here. January 29th is the date by 5 p.m. that you will be submitting your idea for that solution to a problem we, we face here at Penn State. January 29th, we will receive these ideas. There's an online form, I'll show it to you at the end of the webinar, where you'll, you will submit, uh, essentially, if you were to write it out on, on paper, it would be two pages double-spaced, uh, but you'll submit your idea to us, which tells us what, what is the problem, why do you think it's a problem, what's your solution to that problem, what types of AI tools would you use to solve that problem, and what's your team? That's it. Each one of those sections is limited to 300 words. And again, I'll show you the details on all this a little bit later. But that's it. What's the problem? Why is it a problem? What's your solution? How are you using AI? What's your team? Last year, uh, we received about 79 proposals. Uh, in our first year of the challenge, we, we received 23. Uh, last year, we received 79. This year, we're expecting to receive somewhere around 100 uh, ideas. Now, you can submit more than one idea if you'd like. And this is pro tip number one, uh, as we're going through this. I'll, I'll give you some tips and tricks that we've learned throughout this process. Um, you can submit more than one idea. So you can kind of hedge your bets a little bit. You've got a couple of them, but you're not certain whether one idea may resonate or be selected. You can submit more than one. But I would highly recommend that you focus in on, at maximum, let's say, three ideas. Last year, we had a, a, a team that submitted 10 different ideas. And quite honestly, I feel, after having met with the team and talked with them, I feel like a couple of those ideas were gold. They would have done great. But they focused on doing so many of them that they didn't go a deep dive on any of them and really think them through. And I think that was to their detriment. So while, yes, you can submit more than one, I would highly caution you not to just throw as many at us as you possibly can and hope something sticks. Spend a little time. Go deep on, on that idea and think through it. You only have 300 words in each one of the sections that I told you about to, to write your proposal. That's hard. Spend some time crafting those 300 words to get me excited as a reviewer about what you're proposing and what you're trying to convince me is worthwhile. But out of all those teams, let's say, let's say there are 100, out of all those teams, we are going to review those, and I'll talk about the review in a little bit. We'll review those and we'll pick 20 of them. And we'll say, 20 teams, great job. Here's $500 each. Now, go build a prototype. Then we send you along and we bring some resources to the table to help you. This is when the companies come in. So each one of those companies I mentioned, uh, Google, Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, each one of those companies will provide access to their platforms, free access to their platforms. They will provide direct webinars and assistance. They will provide direct communications with some of their software engineers and their software architects. And they will come here to University Park uh, on um, February 20th. I believe I have that day, right? February 20th, in order to hold an immersion day where they will actually provide workshops throughout the day and opportunities to interact and work with uh, those software architects and engineers from those companies so that you are not alone in trying to figure out how do you actually build this prototype. Those 20 teams build those prototypes and then on um, August 3rd, or I'm sorry, April 3rd, those 20 teams will come together and they will present either virtually or in person here at UP. They will present their prototypes in front of an audience of judges. It will be a quick demonstration up on a stage. You'll show us what you've got. You'll tell us why you should be a team that we pick to move forward and why the investment would be a good investment in you. And out of those 20 teams, we pick 10 of those teams and we say, great job. Here's $1,500. Now, go make your prototype better. Build a minimal viable product. Make this thing a real tool that can be used by people. 
then we bring together more resources. The, those uh, AI companies are still there. You get a little bit more in-depth uh, access to, to their personnel and to their resources. If we need to, we can give you a little bit more uh, free access on their platforms if you've exceeded the free tiers already. And we give you that support. We give you some design thinking workshops. Uh, you get the, the pleasure of meeting with me uh, every other week where I help you walk through your solutions. And you have throughout the summer until August 2nd to build your MVP, your minimal viable product. On August 2nd, you submit those minimal viable products to me. A small team of reviewers look at those 10 and we pick five of those 10 to move forward to our pitch contest. Five teams on September 10th come to University Park, get up on stage at the hub. Uh, I believe we're in Heritage Hall, so it's a big stage, big lights, all of that, really intimidating, but you can do it. Uh, you get up on stage and you present in front of a team of reviewers of senior executives from Penn State and uh, executives from each one of those AI companies that I mentioned. Uh, so from Penn State, you're talking at the vice president, vice provost, chancellor, dean level, of leadership here at the university. And they get to sit in front of you while you tell us, here's the thing I built and show it off. And to say, and if I had a little bit more money and a little bit more time, this is what I can do with my idea. You pitch to us why we should invest in your idea. And to invest, there is a pool of $25,000 available. Now, one of the first and most important things you have to do there is to form a team because no individual can do this. Uh, that, that's not even really a tip. Uh, you, you should know that, that to actually go through and build something, you can't do it alone. You need a team. So one of the uh, teams, our top winner from this past year, uh, you can see the picture of right now, our Lion Planner team. Uh, this was a team of, I believe, entirely sophomores, but at most sophomores and juniors. Uh, that had come together. And at first, they didn't have a ton of experience in AI. In fact, I don't believe they had much of any experience in AI and machine learning. They were programmers. Uh, they were in comp sci and engineering. So they had some coding experience, but they had almost no experience in artificial intelligence machine learning. They formed a team, uh, as well as having an individual on the left there, you will see Christy, who was a or is a graphic designer who is able to come to the challenge and provide not technical expertise, but user experience design, user interface design ex expertise. And each one of the other members had different areas of expertise. Some were very good at database. Some of them were good at backend design. Some of them were good at front end design. Some of them worked well in the, in the data science side of things. And they came together as a diverse team and were able to create a solution. Again, remember, sophomores, uh, we're able to create a solution that in total won 40, almost $40,000 in, in funding. Uh, in addition to that, they have since formed an LLC, uh, a limited li uh, company, and they are uh, now at Happy Valley Launchbox uh, in looking at pursuing that idea that they have. So they had this enormous amount of success. And one of the other things that we learned uh, not too long after they won their awards was that uh, they, along with some other teams, had actually thought about not submitting because they thought, we can't do this. This is too much. It's too hard. There's no way that I'm going to win. There are too many people. It's too competitive. And they decided at the last minute to give it a shot anyway, to go ahead and submit. And as I said, they're extremely successful. So one of the things that you have to do right, on, right at the outset is to think about what is your team? Uh, I would recommend you really think about having diversity of roles. Now notice I don't say people. One of the things you'll notice about this team is that there are six people in this photo. There are actually seven people on the team. You don't need to have a team that big, but you do need a team that has representation from a number of different roles. One of, it has to, one of those roles has to be someone who either has experience with or is willing to gain experience with data science, with, with managing, finding, managing, collecting, the data that you're going to need to power any sort of solution you might, you might come up with. You need programmers, people who primarily Python, but you know, that's, that's variable depending on what software platform you're using. Uh, but you need some programmers that can actually do the work of creating the thing. I would recommend you have someone who's experienced or has a talent in graphic design. 
to think through what is the solution going to actually look like? Uh, how is it going to be usable? You can have great technical talent, but not be able to present it in a usable way, and it's not your solution's not going to go very far. You'll you'll peter out at the at the prototype phase because the idea is still good, but what you're showing us doesn't resonate. Uh, so having a graphic designer or a user experience or user interface design person on your team is really important. You need someone who could be a project manager. Who's going to hold everybody to task? Who's going to say, hey, this is due on Wednesday. You need it to me right now. Um, you need those types of people on your team that are going to be the taskmasters and getting things done. And you also need a team leader. Now you'll notice some of these people may be the same. Maybe you've got a graphic designer who's good at project management and can be a team leader. That's one person, three roles, but one person. There are also roles for individuals who are in communications uh, for helping you write the proposals and, and convince the reviewers that we should fund your proposal. Uh, one thing I often say is that it is not necessarily the idea that is funded. It is the proposal that is funded. You can have a great idea, but if you don't write it up in the right way, if you don't convince me that that's a great idea, it's lost. If, however, you could have a, a decent idea, but you present it and write it up in a great, compelling way, something that a communications type person can do, then you may move forward in the competition while, while an idea that may have a broader or deeper impact will be left on the table. So communications person. Sometimes uh, for the idea side, people who are in business are the entrepreneurship, entrepreneur type mindset. Those individuals uh, who are the idea people, and maybe they're not great on the execution or the programming or anything like that, but they can really help you with the ideas as you move through the process. As well as subject matter experts, um, who, who actually knows about the problem, who actually knows about the thing you're trying to create. So, those are the types of people that you may want on your team. Now, there are a few different ways of putting those teams together. Um, usually what happens is you look across your, your group of friends or within your frat or a sorority or you look within your program for people and they're the people close to you that you already know and you bring them together. That's one way and, and that can definitely work. If, however, you don't have some of these people or you don't know where to go to find some of these people or some people with the, these uh, experience in these roles, we've got a couple different things that we're putting together for you. Uh, one of which is a Microsoft Teams space. Uh, Teams, if you haven't used it, is like Slack. Um, it's very much like Slack, uh, but it's, uh, it's part of the Office 365 suite that we have here now at Penn State. Uh, so within off Microsoft Teams, you can go into this space and it's a place for people to say, hey, I'm a great Python programmer, but I have no idea to bring to the table. And someone else to go in there and send a message that says, hey, I've got this great idea, but I've got no technical expertise, and to help those people find one another. Uh, so Microsoft Teams is kind of an asynchronous, uh, digital way of finding each other. We're also doing something a little bit more traditional. Uh, on uh, January 14th, uh, and I'll point you to this on the website. On January 14th, we are actually having an ideation session to help teams come up with ideas, as well as a team formation session immediately after, where we're going to be bringing people together in a room to say, hey, let's, let's share our, our ideas and our expertise and let's form some teams here. Uh, so January 14th, we'll have that face-to-face -face, uh, and the Microsoft Teams space is available whenever uh, you want 24-7. So one of the things people always ask me is, All right, so give me some ideas. What ideas have been funded in the past? Uh, some place to start from. Uh, what I will say is this year we have expanded the challenge. So you'll notice all these ideas I'm about to give you are all somewhat related to the student experience, uh, directly impacting students here at the university. Uh, that was the challenge always in the past, which was uh, come up with a solution to improve the student experience at Penn State. We've broadened it this year significantly, if you really think about it. Uh, this year, we have said, come up with a solution to a challenge faced at Penn State, which can be anything. That can be student experience. That can be Penn State operations. It can be really broad. And I'll get to that in detail in a second. But I just wanted you to notice that in these ideas, it's because they were more limited in the past. Uh, so these are all related to the student experience. Uh, the first was an idea in our first round uh, called Colonote. 
it was this brilliant idea of having collaborative note-taking tool that uh, multiple individuals across multiple sections of a course can all take notes and the artificial intelligence would come would would bring those notes and bring them into one authoritative set that they would provide to the faculty member to look through and thumb up thumb down sections to create the best notes possible from any particular co course and then what it also did was it added an ai agent to the side that allowed you to ask questions about concepts and ideas and portions of that course and have the AI look through the notes and answer the questions for you as well as to point you to where in those notes you could go to learn more about that topic. So you can think about you know how powerful that would be for studying for a course, studying for a final, which you're probably thinking about quite a bit right now, um, how to study for a final within a course. It was a, it was a great idea, very elegant, well-designed, great interface, uh, it, and it was one of the first tools that made it through our challenge. Another one is Lion Planner team that I just mentioned. That was uh, the photo that I showed you a second ago that uh, team won almost $40,000 in the challenge. Uh, they created this beautiful, again, elegant, beautiful way of creating an entire degree plan in a very intuitive drag and drop way, where basically you would put in what your intended major was. It would sort out every course you had to take in the, the optimal uh, order in this nice interface. And then you could drag and drop the classes around as well as substitute classes uh, throughout your course plan. And it would warn you if you were taking things out of order, if you were missing requirements. Uh, and it also provided you recommendations if you didn't like one of the courses that was inclu included in your degree plan. It would provide uh, uh, intelligent suggestions as to what you should uh, take as an alternate. Uh, again, a really well-designed functional tool that solved a real problem in making degree planning much easier here at the university. Uh, Pathfinder was another one uh, that allowed you to do a degree plan, but what it added was uh, it added a, uh, a way of, of predicting what your course grades would be in each one of those courses based on the order you took them. So say, for instance, you had a four course sequence, but they didn't have to be in any particular order you could move them around and as you move them around based on past uh, past student performance in that class it would tell you what your likely grade would be in that course based on the order you took them uh, so again a way of optimizing your degree plan and last there was one uh, called professor nittany in our first round it was a personalized q a chat tool that basically answered it was a it was a 24 7 personal ad penn state advisor that could answer questions that you had about the university in an automated format. So it was always there and always available to you. Those are some of the best ideas that have come through in the last, th uh, last two years. This year, one of the things I, to, to get you started to think more broadly outside the student experience, this year you can think about some major buckets. Um, one of them would be a, a solution in the prospective student services category. So say you're, Go back a few years. Imagine before you became a student here at Penn State. What did you struggle with? How did you pick Penn State? When you once you picked Penn State, what were the problems you faced in trying to get into Penn State? What were the questions you may have had? What were the challenges that you faced in your process between saying I'm going to college and actually walking onto campus as an enrolled student? There are a lot of different challenges there that you could impact. High impact learning. So this is in the classroom, the, the stuff you do day to day as you're going into classroom. How can you make it better? I guarantee you, you have ideas. I guarantee you have complaints. So if you have complaints, figure, up, figure out the ideas to address those, to make it better. What could you do? Colonode is a good example of that, that I just gave, that collaborative note-taking tool. Enrolled student services. Okay, you're here. Now what? How could you make the experience better? for people who are here. So this is everything from how do you find clubs? How do you get engaged? Uh, how do you register for your classes each semester? This can be how do you get around campus? Uh, how do you find food and dining? Uh, this can be anything that directly impacts you as a student here at the university, advising, transfer credit, uh, all of those, uh, financial aid, 
all of those elements. There's a lot of potential there. New for this year is the next one, which is university operations. And sometimes it's a little challenging because this is outside of what you probably interact with day to day. Uh, but this is the, the, the stuff that keeps this place running. Um, Remember, Penn State is a business on top of, uh, a sort of business, on top of just being uh, an educational institution. We have to keep the lights on. We have to clear the sidewalks of snow. We have to do all of those things. We have to keep the buildings from falling down. Uh, so university operations, a physical plant. That means the buildings that you're in, he, uh, heating, venting, and air conditioning, uh, lights. How do you optimize the HVAC system, heating, venting, and air conditioning? How do you optimize that system in the buildings to lower costs? Because anything you can do to lower costs at this university translates into lower tuition down the road. How do you optimize the way we remove snow from the sidewalks so that it takes half the people and half the time to do it? Uh, how do you uh, optimize the way that maintenance workers go into your dorm rooms to fix problems that you may have so that they do it more quickly and they have the right tools when they get there? How are, can you fix those types of things? Development here at the university, there's fundraising. Uh, whenever you see those, uh, those news stories about someone giving a $3 million gift to the university or starting a new scholarship, that's from our development people. How could, you, how could you make their job easier? How could you optimize that process? Housing, how do you find the right place to live? Uh, as I said, the maintenance worker, how do you get the maintenance out there uh, in, in the optimal way? Can you use artificial intelligence to do that? Machine learning to learn and get better at sending people out uh, to particular places? Or could you even find a way of anticipating problems before they become problems? There are a lot of uh, potential uh, applications there. Alumni relations. So this is, you've already graduated. Penn State wants to stay in contact with you. Penn State wants to keep offering you services and doing things for you, keeping you engaged, possibly turning you into one of those, develop, one of those people that development talks to. What can you possibly do to help uh, connect alumni? How could you provide some services to alumni that help them in their careers or getting new jobs or finding each other or forming social groups? Again, a lot of potential there. Now those are a couple buckets or a few buckets. Maybe you've got something that doesn't fit any of those. That's great. We also kind of have this wild card category, whatever you think of. If you've got something that impacts Penn State, then it fits within this challenge. It's got to impact Penn State and use artificial intelligence or machine learning. Any of those would work. And that wild card is for anything that doesn't fit in one of those predefined buckets. There is no point value associated to any of these buckets. You will not be penalized if you go into wild card and not one of the others. Uh, one thing that it will say though, is that uh, the idea you come up with has to have meaning, has to have potential for impact. That'll be one of the criteria you see in a second. So one of the things with the buckets that I gave is that it's predefined that there is value there. We know that these are problems that we have at the university. We know these are things we need to do. If you go wild card, you run a little bit of a risk of doing something that, uh, that will not be, be perceived as having value. So way around that, pro tip, whatever number we're up to. If you're doing something in the wild card, I would highly recommend that you reach out to who your end users would be. Uh, so say you're doing something that doesn't fit any of these buckets, uh, but it has to do with uh, student engagement of some way. Uh, you should reach out to the Student Engagement Network and take to, talk to Mike Zeman in the Student Engagement Network and see if you can talk to him and get his support and maybe get a short couple sentences letter of support uh, to send in with your idea. Uh, that way you're conveying to us, hey, I've done my homework. I know this is a problem, and this is why I've come up with a solution. Once you've got your idea, then you refine that idea. Uh, one thing is what I just described, which is meeting with end users and soliciting feedback. Talk to the people who actually have this problem and the, and the problems that, they're running, that, that you say you're going to solve. Talk to them. Find out you actually have a grasp on what the real problem is. You will also have the opportunity to meet with me whenever you want. Uh, you can reach out to me if you want to talk through your idea uh, at any point from now on. Uh, you can reach out to me and I will, I will set up meetings with you and I'll talk through your idea. I will tell you that I'm already actively meeting with about 20 teams. Um, so my, 
my schedule is getting a little cramped, uh, so you'd want to reach out a little bit sooner than later. Uh, definitely don't reach out to me three days before the due date. Uh, I probably won't have time at that point, but any any time from now until January 29th, let me know and I'll do what I can to listen to your idea and give you some feedback on it. And then you submit. Uh, ideas are due January 29th. Uh, all of the required format criteria and re the review rubric are all on our website, which I'm going to show you in just a second. We are as transparent as we possibly can. We don't want anything to be a secret. Nothing is, is kept from you. We show you the exact forms that we give to our reviewers for reviewing your ideas. So there's no reason to be surprised uh, as to what we are looking for. It's all right there. So the criteria, what do we look for? Here it is. Uh, in the first round, in the idea round, it is a 20 point scale uh, split across four different criteria. Number one is impact. Is this thing actually going to matter? Does it, is it going to have an impact at Penn State? And is that impact more than just a one-off where it solves a problem, but now the problem's gone and, and it's, uh, everything's okay now? Uh, is it going to have a long-term impact on the university? Second, feasibility. So great, it has, it's going to have an impact, it's meaningful. Can you do it? That's going to be one of our questions is, is it not just your, not about your team, we'll get to that later, but can you realistically actually build this thing uh, without bringing magic into the, into the equation? Uh, very often development ideas come with, uh, well, here's the problem, here's our solution, we're going to do this, 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 then magic happens, and then we'll have that. Uh, you have to be able to actually give us a guideline from beginning to end. How are you going to do this thing? How does it actually work? Do you have the data? Can you even get the data? Or is it impossible? Uh, can AI and machine learning actually do what you say it's going to do? Uh, or are you making up uh, capabilities that that are are not fe are, that are not feasible right now. So that's feasibility. Use of AI and machine learning. Do you actually use AI or machine learning within your solution? Again, remember we're the Nittany AI Alliance. This is all about uh, combining artificial intelligence with uh, the problems we have at Penn State. So you have to tell us how are you going to use it. Not a ton of detail. Again, you only have 300 words. Uh, we're not looking for exactly which tools you're going to use or anything like that. But explain to us, where's AI or ML within your solution? And then finally, your team capabilities. Who are you? Who are the people on your team? Can you actually do this? So go back to those roles that I talked about earlier. This is your place to tell us, yes, we've got someone who, who knows graphic design. Yes, we've got someone who's a programmer and we've got a data scientist and this person's going to be our project manager. We've got all these skill sets within our team. We can do this. This is where if you're a team of one or quite honestly, a team of two without some really strong skills, this is where you'll have some problems. That said, last year, one of our top three teams was a team of two. They just happened to be two individuals that had a diversity of skill sets. And they were able to convince us of that in their team capability section. They were able to say, here's my past experience of what I've done. This is my team member's past experience of what they've done. We cover all the roles between the two of us. Uh, and like I said, they were very successful. Uh, they won almost $20,000 in total throughout the challenge. So with that, we're, we're almost done. I'm just gonna take a second to actually show you the website uh, and what's on the website to help you navigate through it. Um, so the website is actually challenge, oops, I went back one too far. The, uh, the website is actually challenge.nittanyai.psu.edu. There we go. Uh, this is the main website for the challenge and where you will be able to find all the information that I just gave you as well as the uh, materials that you need to be able to actually submit. Um, you will notice under home and about, that's most of the information uh, we just talked about, the broad overview of things. Uh, key dates and events, we'll get to in a second. Get involved uh, allows you to click on compete in the challenge. It doesn't look like I have a faculty or staff on the call right now, but if I do, uh, you also have the possibility for mentoring a team or being a sponsor or being an ambassador for the challenge. Uh, but competing in the challenge will bring you to the place where you actually submit your idea. 
what we're going to talk about very quickly is under the resources for participants. So a couple things. First, you'll notice discussion forums and team formation. Remember, I told you that there would be a link to Microsoft Teams. That is, uh, this is where you will find that link. Site seems to be running very slow right now, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I have clicked on that link. And we wait. Wow. Okay, I will see what we can do about uh, figuring out what's going on with the site. It's possible that something's being updated right now and is what is causing the delay. And I'll pre-open a few tabs that we're going to need in order to get going here. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and I'll move to the submission criteria instead while that other page is loading up. Uh, so under resources for participants, you'll see your submission criteria. Here, you will see the details for each one of the phases. I've only talked about the idea phase right now, but you'll see the rest of them. Uh, you'll notice idea phase proposals are due by 5 p.m. on January 29th, that's 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we take about two weeks to do the review uh, and we'll announce on February 15th. But most importantly, if you click on the view the idea phase submission criteria, you will notice that here has all the details. So there's the actual form that you will click on. I'll open that new tab so you can see it. And it tells you all the materials that you need before you actually open up that form. This is the idea format. Uh, first, you need demographic information on all of your team members. We need to know first, last name, Penn State user ID, campus, college, and major uh, for each one of the team members. Then we have the actual content of the proposal. You give us a description. What is the problem? You give us uh, the solution uh, that you're going to have. What are you actually going to build to address that problem? Then team description. And then finally, the use of AI technologies. You will notice each one of these says 300 word maximum. So in total, you've got a maximum of 1,200 words here uh, across all the sections. Once you actually start to write this up, you'll find that is extremely limiting and it's very difficult. Uh, so that's why I say you want to spend a little bit of time actually crafting these, these responses. Then we tell you about the review criteria. Here they are. These are the ones I just described for you. Uh, each one of the four criteria and the data points under each one. The actual form looks like this. Um, when you come in, you click on, let's go back one, you actually click on the link. You will be taken to this form. We'll ask you for the title of your project. So we'll call this project. You'll tell us how many members are on your team. Then you put in the details for each one of those members. So you'll notice, because I said there are five members, there'll be spaces for, mem for details on all five members. We'll move that back to one just so I don't have to do as much. And we'll put in some names. There we go. You tell us what campus that person is from. You tell us what college they're in. And then you can tell us their major. And then finally, do you have a faculty or staff advisor? This is not required. But it is recommended, it's one of those things that I recommend you to think about. If you're going to do something in the advising space, for instance, you want to create an artificial intelligence driven academic advisor, go talk to an advisor. It, it, trust me, if you reach out to an advisor and you say, hey, I want to build a solution to make your job easier, uh, and I just like to talk to you for a few minutes about it, they will find the time and they will help you. So reach out to people. If you've got a faculty member uh, that you think might be able to help you through some of the challenges you're inevitably going to run into, reach out to them and say, hey, would you be willing to help us with this? Put their name in here just so we know who that advisor is, uh, particularly if it's somebody that I've worked with in the past. Uh, I'll, I'll know who they are. And it means a little bit to me when I'm reading your proposal. I say, hey, if Lee Giles out of College of IST is on this team, I know they've got their AI side of things pretty locked down. Uh, I can trust that because he wouldn't have signed off on this otherwise. Once you submit that information, then you will notice problem description, 300 words. Solution description, 300 words. Team description, 300 words. And use of AI technologies, 300 words. You give us all that information. I've got to put in some content here just to be able to get through the validation. Once you do that, 
you will see the intellectual property agreement. Uh, this is one of those things that is required uh, from Penn State Legal. Uh, the very brief overview of it is that if you are an undergraduate student, then you uh, maintain act, you maintain control and ownership of your intellectual property all the way up to the point that you receive over $10,000 out of the challenge. Uh, once uh, you receive over $10,000, uh, then it triggers a, a situation where Penn State then takes the intellectual property and then licenses it back to you to do with it as you will. Um, but uh, you have to sign off on this intellectual property agreement in order to be able to move forward in the challenge. So you'd say, yes, I agree to it, and you move forward, and you're done. And that's the end of it. You must complete this process. You must have this screen up, up by 5 p.m. on January 29th. You will notice under the resources for participants, there is also a terms and conditions page. You can go through here to find all the different terms and conditions and eligibility. Here's that intellectual property agreement that I just clicked agree to on the form. Uh, it's all listed in here. The big overview, number one, you have to be a student uh, graduate or undergraduate as of January 29th, 2019. You do not have to be a student on September, what was it, September 10th, uh, when you actually uh, when you actually pitch for your MVP. If you make it that far, it does not matter if you had already graduated. You just must be a student on January 29th, 2019. Uh, there's no limit to the number of individuals on a team. Uh, when people ask me about ideal team size, my answer is usually one is too few, 70 is too many, uh, somewhere in there. Ideal size seems to be around six, somewhere around there, five or six. Um, but like I said, we've had very successful teams of two, and we've had very unsuccessful teams of 12. Uh, so, you know, it, it depends more on the people and the idea than it does on the, necessarily on the size of the team. Uh, if you are a person who happens to have uh, some much needed skill sets, uh, you can serve on more than one team if you like. That said, one of the things you saw in the criteria is, can the team do this? Is it feasible? If you are on all 20 of the teams that we want to move forward, uh, select at the idea phase, it is, very, it is not feasible at all that you're going to be able to do the work for 20 teams. So again, I would highly recommend that you look at a few strategic teams to be part of, but don't overextend yourself. Just like I said about writing the ideas, do two or three, but not 10, not 15, don't split yourself up that much. Um, and one other element that, that we have in here is that you don't actually have to be selected in any particular phase to submit to the next phase. So say you submit an idea and you don't get picked as one of the, uh, the 20, but you think, you know what? It's a good idea, I'm gonna do this anyway. I think I have a shot, they just didn't see my vision. You can still create that prototype and then submit it to us in the next phase and, and be able to show off that prototype. Uh, you do not have to win in any particular phase to submit to the next phase. Uh, that said, the, the only exception to that is the final pitch. We will only have five submitted to the final pitch. You can submit with the 10 that will be reviewed to be selected for that final five, uh, but we will only pick five to be as part of that final pitch. And one last thing that I want to bring up that's very important, and this is a huge pro tip uh, for you uh, having the best possibility of moving forward in the challenge, is this Oracle challenge. So as I said, Oracle is our lead sponsor this year. And what Oracle has done is they've said, all right, what we want is for uh, teams to use our technologies, to use the Oracle technologies. We will guarantee that two teams that use the Oracle tools will move through to the uh, minimal viable product stage. That means at least two teams that use the Oracle tools in the idea phase will be selected, and at least two teams that use the Oracle tools will be selected in the prototype phase to move through the MVP. So it gives you a huge leg up if you're using their tools that you uh, will be part of a smaller subset that will be guaranteed of moving through. Uh, so again, that doesn't guarantee you as an individual that you'll be moving through, but it guarantees that two teams that use those tools will be moving through. 
Uh, so it's something you want, you want to think about as you're looking at the technologies. In the idea phase, you don't have to get too into detail as to what part of the technologies you're using, uh, but you can indicate during the idea phase that you're using the Oracle technologies uh, to be part of that kind of sub-challenge within the challenge. And uh, that is most of it. It seems like our discussion forum link is still not working. Um, and I will see if I can get, oh, there we go. I'm not sure what was going on there. Uh, if you'll remember, uh, this was under resources for participants and the discussion forum and team formation. Uh, you will see that you can click on this link right here and it will open up that Teams group uh, to, to uh, bring you to that central communication hub for saying, hey, I've got this skill set or I need this skill on my team. So with that, that's, that's pretty much the overview of the challenge. Uh, a couple tips and tricks that I've given throughout, uh, but things you might want to think about. Number one is convince me. So what you want to do is there are two different wows that I can have when I read a proposal. And then there are the bulk of proposals that get very little reaction. Uh, you want one of those two types of wows. I can either look at your proposal and go, whoa, that that doesn't even make sense or the grammar is all over the place spelling is wrong they barely put any information into each one of the sections you know this is one that i'm going to toss out not even send to the reviewers which happens uh last year that happened with seven of our, of our proposals uh they had no chance and they weren't even moved on to the to the reviewers however there's also a wow that I can have when I read that. When I read your proposal and I think to myself, I never thought about that before, or I never thought about a solution like that. Those wow type submissions don't come from your first idea. I promise you that. Some people say, take your first idea, write it down on paper, and then throw it in the trash can. I tend to see it a little bit differently. I say, get your first idea, put it down on paper, and then start ripping it apart, making it better take sections and cross them out and improve them. Your best ideas are going to come in your fourth or fifth iteration. Second part of that pro tip is, when you get that idea written up and you've gone through it a few variations and you've made it better, give it to your friends. Give it to five or six different people and say, hey, can you read this for me? It's two pages, double spaced. They can find the time. Ask them to read through it for you. Ask them for their feedback and use that feedback to make your idea better. I am shocked every year when I have debriefs with teams that did not make it through and I ask them, who looked at your idea before you submitted it? And no one outside the team looked at it. Take that opportunity. You have the criteria. Give your friends the criteria for review and say, review my proposal for me. And get that feedback. I guarantee that will make a more successful and powerful proposal than if you just think that you've got it all right now and submit it in. Have people give you the feedback and be open to the criticism that you're going to get and use that to, to construct a better proposal. That's it. That's most of it. Um, there are additional resources uh, on the page here. Uh, where you can see uh, tools that each one of the AI companies uh, have brought to the table. Uh, there are data sources where you can see some, uh, some basic uh, de-identified data sources uh, you can use for creating your solution. Uh, this grants page just gives you details of how we distribute the money. Uh, short answer to that is we distribute the money to the team lead. Uh, and then the team lead is responsible for distributing it to the rest of the team. Uh, that is just the way that it that works. Um, we had problems our first year when we tried to to give the money to each team member. Uh, there was fighting and questions and problems. And so this year and last year, we simply give it to the team lead and it's up to the team lead to distribute. Um, and then finally, a couple of things going on. Um, I told you about the competing in the challenge, uh, and the which is our next webinar, and the idea, ideation and team formation workshop, which is on the 14th. Uh, so those are the next two big things that happen before the January 29th due date. So with that, questions. 
I haven't seen anything pop up in the in the group chat, so uh, I haven't had anything that I've responded to yet. Uh, but are there any questions that you have? All right, I'll give a couple minutes. Um, but if uh, if you have no questions, uh, what I'll do is I'll just say thank you. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope that you are interested in competing in the challenge. It's a great way to access uh, some funding. It's a great way to access a opportunity. Uh, one of the things that we hear again and again and again is that this challenge of participation in it, whether you succeeded or not, has been the differentiator for individuals who are going out and looking for their jobs, who are trying to get their first jobs out of college. Uh, it is a key differentiator that when they sit down with that interviewer, this is the thing that they want to talk about. Because it is a unique experience that you don't get anywhere else. You get to work with, with diverse teams, actually creating a real thing, just like you will be doing when you move into industry. And so that is why interviewers focus in on this challenge. Not only do you get to actually work with people from Google and Amazon and Oracle and Microsoft throughout the challenge, but you get doors opened up for you for possible jobs down the line. Uh, and I often say uh, the $50,000 as part of this challenge, you know, the overall $50,000, that's one thing. Um, but it's $50,000 uh, and, and you're, you're, Total portion, you know, is about twenty-seven thousand dollars altogether. Uh, if you if you get the whole the whole uh, award at the end, but that is small compared to what it could mean if you if this helps you get uh, to start your job at five or six thousand dollars more than you would have otherwise started that job. That salary offer that you get when you go out and you get your your position when you get your job. That compounds over the, your career into much, much more than, than this money that's available right now. The money right now is nice, and it, it keeps you motivated and keeps you going, and it's nice to be recognized for what you're doing. But it, the real impact is what it's going to do for you, for your career, and for your capabilities, and for your successes down the road. And that's really why we're doing this. Uh, we truly, deeply believe that AI and machine learning are going to impact every single discipline out there. Uh, fine art. I don't know if you saw the news story a few months ago. The first uh, AI-generated piece of fine art was sold at auction. Uh, marketing communications. Most of the marketing that happens to you now is not being decided on by humans. It's being decided on by artificial intelligence. Uh, these types of, of disciplines are going to be impacted, and you have to have some sort of literacy. And that's why we're doing this, to give you that literacy, to give you that opportunity. So with that, I didn't see any questions come up. Uh, oh, here we go. Sure. Uh, so the question is a little confused about the $10,000 IP rule. Uh, how much does Penn State own uh, for the most successful ideas? So uh, the way it works right now is that uh, up to $10,000, Penn State owns nothing. Uh, if you were an undergraduate student, uh, the, 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 what actually happens is the IP policy that you're under right now stays in place. So for undergraduate students, that means you own 100% of the IP. For graduate students, it's a little bit more complicated. And if you want to talk about that offline, we can talk about that. But basically, we don't change anything from the way you're working right now as you're in your relationship with Penn State up until that $10,000. If you accept over $10,000, and that doesn't mean you're awarded, but you actually accept over $10,000, what happens is your IP transfers to Penn State. Penn State then owns 100% of your IP. What Penn State then does is it licenses that IP back to you for what are called uh, uh, agreeable terms. Uh, so usually what, it, what they do is they license it back to you for a nominal amount, like a dollar. Uh, they license it back to you for a dollar a year. And then once you earn a certain amount uh, off that idea, so say you become the next Facebook or whatever, once you start earning, and I, I'm making up numbers right now because this is negotiated on a, on a team by team basis. But let's say uh, the trigger is when you bring in your first million dollars of investment, then Penn State then gets access to 2% of that or 3% of that. Um, that's usually the types of agreements that go into place. Now, that may seem 
strange or maybe even a, a bad deal at first. Uh, but one of the things, if you haven't worked in this space before, one of the things you may not realize is how expensive it is to protect ideas. One of the huge benefits of having Penn State as the owner, not licensee, but the owner of the IP, is that Penn State then has a responsibility of protecting your IP in the marketplace, uh, which means all the legal costs that go along with that, including patenting, copywriting, trademarking, uh, as well as uh, enforcing any sort of patent infringement that may come out of intellectual property that you have. Uh, so Penn State takes care of all that. Now, I will say we're in the process of trying to negotiate a slightly different IP agreement with Penn State, uh, but that is not in place right now. What is in place right now is what I just described to you. Does that help? Um, IP can be very, very complicated and confusing. Uh, and if you have more questions about it, you want a deeper dive, uh, you can feel to reach out to me directly. and We can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, about IP. Um, but like I said, the, the description is written up on the website uh, of the actual IP policy. And, and, uh, and I can give you more details in person if you want. Any other questions? All right, since I don't see anything up here, I will tell you, you'll probably think of a question tomorrow or five minutes after we end this call. Uh, my email, I am putting in the chat right now. Feel free uh, to shoot me an email, reach out to me. I'd be more than willing to meet with you. I'd be more than willing to talk through your idea. I'd be more than willing to answer any questions that you have. Uh, that is completely up to you. Uh, I will help in any way that I possibly can. Oh yeah, one more question. So uh, if your experience in AI is limited, what resources help most to learn? Uh, so a couple different things. Uh, we bring as many resources to the table as we can. Each one of the companies that I talked about, uh, Google, Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, each one of them has actual curriculum online to teach you any of the components of the artificial intelligence you may need to learn. So for instance, say you're going to be using natural language processing. Uh, there are entire NLP sections of, you know, uh, of anywhere from a few to a dozen videos uh, that walk you through how to use our tools and what NLP is and what it does. Everywhere from you know the stage of I don't even know what that is to I'm an expert now. Um, so those resources are available. Teams usually end up supplementing a lot of those resources with YouTube videos. Uh, to be blunt and honest, uh, very often there is an on-demand uh, need there. So just-in-time learning, you have a problem, you've, uh, you need a solution, you go into YouTube, you search it, and you find the solution there. We also will have a number of uh, webinars actually held by the companies, uh, kind of on-demand as we notice that there are certain needs, certain areas of confusion within the technologies. Uh, so the companies will be holding, hosting webinars throughout the challenge. In addition to that, we have that immersion day that I told you about on February 20th, uh, where the companies will actually be here and be doing a full day of workshops uh, to help teams uh, create their, their prototypes. And then finally, you also will have access directly to, uh, to the software engineers and architects from each one of these, these companies. Uh, all of that, well, not all of that, all of those really in-depth ones, the direct access to the architects, architects and engineers, the, uh, more, the more specific webinars, all of those are triggered once the ideas are selected. Uh, so, you know, how do you access these? Uh, the rest of them, the videos, the training resources, those will be up on our website. Uh, they were supposed to be up at by the end of last week. I didn't see them today. So all those should be linked uh, in the next day or two uh, on our website. And basically that will have links to all of those training programs from each one of the four companies. Uh, those will be all be online and they all be under the resources for participants. Uh, there'll be another item in this drop down menu that, that says something along the lines of, um, of training resources. The one-on-one, -on -one, just because of the volume, uh, if we get 100 ideas and let's say four people per team, that's 400 students, obviously we can't throw 400 students at, at Microsoft and Google and say, you know, uh, give direct interaction with, with that many people. Uh, so that's only triggered after the ideas are selected. Okay, so with that, we're at time. 
Uh, if you have questions, send them out to me. I'll be more than happy to answer anything uh, that, that you think of. Uh, and I very much look forward to seeing your ideas. Thank you so much for the time and attention. And let me know if there's any way that I can help. Thanks so much.